In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicott. Official podcast of Vundablog.com, the home of joy and happiness, the place where we know you're rebranding, huh? That Greg Kinnear is yeah. a wet blanket. Yeah, this 2019. Steven wants to rebrand the Vundablog. He or he doesn't want it to be the home or whatever. I'm gonna be frank. Let's have a frank discussion about our podcast. And well, our I'm your host, Steven. No, wait. First, Frank's. No, I'm kidding. Yes, that's Steven. I'm Danny. I want to have a frank discussion. And now we're in a frank discussion. I am. There's no frank here. Well, we not that with, frank. We're all with the Midnight Hounds. Morty's licking himself. No, yeah. I just want to... I just realized that, like, our website has really kind of become, in a way, our own sort of podcast network that we basically do all... Because you have... Because nowadays, you know, you used to just do the website and you used to just have a bunch of, like, random goofy posts that you really didn't. But now, for the most part... Well, okay. It's no, podcast. No, 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 we're going into history. Yeah. Of the Vundercast and the Vunderblog.com. Okay. Mm-hmm. Since I uh, like this, this is, this is a hot topic. Yeah, it's a hot topic. I've never discussed. So, it began in 2009. It did. When I took a class about blogging, about creative writing. And uh, one of our topics was to create a blog. And I created a blog called Comic Book Weakness. Weakness spelled W E E K. We're going all the way back. N E S S, because that's cool. And I made a bunch of posts then and wrote a bunch of different, you know, fan castings, you know, typical nerdy things. And uh, and then when I eventually met Danielle and D Rock, D Rock also had a plentiful amount of blog that wasn't getting any uh, attention. So we fused all content mm-hmm. into bundablog.com yeah and which is uh, why we went for so long as the home of whatever because it was anything and everything that yeah. we were interested in d-rock at one point was talking about football and pol- politics he's, he's still occasionally does and it. heavy things like yeah. that um and we still do yeah. but i think that we've kind of, i have at least in the past few years since things have gotten so dark i've tried to aggregate it more into a place of escape for yeah. people. Um, I and, agree. You know. No, I, th- I think that our, our focus has, our focus has kind of, like I said, we've become sort of a podcast network site because mm-hmm. we host our podcast, we host D-Rock's podcast, his stuff, and then Frank's and, mm-hmm. and J, and yeah. uh, Mr. Uh, J's and, yeah, I've, I sort of aggregated it into yeah, a little a small bit of a network of eclectic network. podcasts. Exactly. Because I, I just, you know, it's weird to have a bunch of different but shows. We, but our podcast that we do together, we focus mostly on pop culture, films, TV. Film, TV, yeah. horror, Star yeah. Wars. But now we've branched out and we have a uh, dedicated Star Wars podcast yes. that Danielle uh, manages and, and flies through the hyperspace quadrants. Of the world, it's called the Rebel Order, and uh, we'd really appreciate it if you guys uh, gave us a listen, subscribe, click the link on the feed, and give us leave us a rate and rating and a review. Our, is, uh, our, we're still finding our niche, but I think that we're just sort of like this podcast. We sort of talk about what we are interested in, um, but that tends to be currently for the year twenty nineteen stuff about episode nine, um, stuff about Kylo Ren and uh, Ben Solo's 
redemption, stuff about Ray and Kylo Ren and their future relationship, Raylo. Um, also, we like to talk about Star Wars Resistance. Different pieces, yeah, Star Wars Resistance. Different pieces of the world that could potentially influence the film coming up. So we're kind of it. It is a little bit speculative, but unlike other speculation blog uh, story videos that kind of just whoosh out into outer mm -hmm. space, we try to focus and ground on stuff that we've been given and we try to see educate. How, yeah. A little bit about filmmaking processes behind the scenes and history and I'm actually I really enjoyed our last episode a lot even though yeah. it was it was kind of a, a process to record because yeah. of uh, um, you know hectic schedules and having yeah. to do it at horrible hours but uh, we reviewed and sort of analyzed a uh, 1973 74 no, 73 73 film the man called noon which is a dope little spaghetti western um, with some very interesting visuals, although the action is deliciously... Silly. Silly. And, you know, people throw knives, like, <laughs> in, like, 2.8 seconds. And that one perfect. guy's that knife was so throw good. was amazing. That was, like, totally a reverse shot. Yeah. And, you know, it's just it was spectacular. It's like, catch it in your hat. What? <laughs> um, so, yeah. So this is... We're back in Vundacast mode. Good to be here in the Vundercast. Oh, no, the fan's alone. Power down fan. If you heard a weird sound, that was the fan. Okay. So we're here with the Midnight Hounds. I wonder why professional recording studios don't have loud overhang over ceiling fans. I don't know. I mean, I bet you when... Uh... Oh, no, wait. I don't want to go into a dark place. God damn it. <laughs> I was going to... Oh, I got to go in there. My old friend. Um, I watched... Recently, in the dark dive, I oh, watched no. R. Kelly oh, yeah. um, documentary, and one of the notes of R. Kelly's documentary was that he had bedrooms in his recording studio. Yeah. So in a recording studio, there was a full bed yeah. <laughs> laying in there. So R. Kelly had ceiling. I'm sure if he had a bed like we do in our recording studio, mm -hmm. he needs a ceiling fan. It gets hot. Ugh. Right? He's gross. Super, super gross. Uh... And there's a lot of gross, gross, horrible things in the world. But let's not talk about any of those things right now. Yeah. So we're going <laughs> to talk about... We're going to go back in time right now. Okay, to start off the show. We're going to talk about three films this episode, hopefully. About female-led films. The first one we're going to talk about, 2001. The Gift. Sam Raimi directed... Written by Billy Bob Thornton and probably some other hillbilly friend of his. The Gift. The Starring Gift, yes. Kate Blanchett. Now, In an I... early film star starring role. Oh my god. I know this what movie you're is all thinking. A gem right why now. the fuck is Steven talking about The Gift? Who put Steven onto The Gift this random 2000? And it's not the other Gift. That one with uh, Joel Edgerton, right? That guy. He did a movie uh, called The Gift too. Remember that horrible one? That was, a, one that was a creepy one. The one where he like raped the chick. Yeah, where he's in like, her creepy, sleep. Creepy neighbor guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, creepy that was a bad guy. gift. That was a bad gift. Yeah, this is the that. other bad gift. No, um, I'm not going. Uh, <laughs> wow, but there was still rapey stuff in it. Yes. Wow. wow. So is it just inherent that gifts are filled with you know unwanted? When you name your film The Gift, you're not naming it because it's like a fun movie about like you know candy and popcorn. It's obviously the gift yeah. of horror is what they're giving. So oh. um. So basically, it was just a random day last week that Stephen and I were hanging out. Um, we kind of had some, finally had some downtime after all the nutty things that's been going on in the past two months in our lives. And we were just chilling. And I said, oh, have you ever seen this movie? The Gift. It's so silly. It has Keanu Reeves in it. Da, 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 da. And then he's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, you've never seen this movie? I'm like, all right, we're going to watch it. So he watched it. And I don't know why I, I didn't, I was kind of 50-50 whether or not he would Watch like it. Watch this, it has Keanu yeah. Reeves. I was 50-50 about whether or not he would enjoy it, but um, but he did. He did enjoy it. And then I for, had completely forgotten that it was directed by Sam Raimi, and I did not even think about the fact that it was written by Billy Bob Thornton, because I don't like to think about Billy Bob Thornton that much. Yeah. Um, and this is a movie that starred, at the time, an all-star cast. When I tell you, Kate Blanchett... Wow. Giovanni Ribisi, Keanu wow. Reeves, Katie Holmes, Greg Kinnear, Bro, Hillary okay. Swank. Pause real quick. Okay. This is like this is not hit. This is not um Katie Holmes. This is fucking Joe from fucking Dawson's Creek. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
straight up in this movie. Mm -hmm. She's exactly... I'm pretty sure she did this film as she was doing Dawson's Creek. Mm -hmm. And she is Probably. totally topless, totally naked. She is the main plot device that out of, there of this the, film. Furling, yeah, yes, like, I'm unfurling it here. Yeah. I'm enticing the children oh, with the sex and candy. Uh huh. Okay. So, okay, so this movie, uh, another strange thing about this movie um, was that it was... It was definitively a labor of love picture because it was only made for ten million dollars, oh. and even in the year two thousand, which is now almost twenty years ago, that still was not a lot of mo money for a movie that starred. Argument. Remember, two thousand. Mm -hmm. What had come out the year before, nineteen ninety nine? The Matrix, one of the biggest blockbuster pictures mm -hmm. ever, starring Keanu Reeves. So for Keanu Reeves and Kate Blanchett, I think Lord of the Rings was. Oh yeah, you can see. As you can see, we're not ready for a commercial. We're excited about Keanu Reeves, dude. Oh, Duke, you're excited about Keanu Reeves, too? Do you love Keanu Reeves? We should have named him Keanu Reeves. <laughs> 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 Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves. Anyway, sorry about the dogs. Anyway, so, and then Kate Blanchard, I think, was in production to do Lord of the Rings, right? Mm -hmm. she, I mean, that hadn't come out yet. Yeah, but, but it, if, if it's around that time, yeah. she was... Probably like leaving, on coming it. back yeah. from New Zealand, whatever exactly, the hell. Exactly, exactly. So mm -hmm. these people, and then Katie Holmes, like you said, was in Dawson's Creek. These people were doing big movies. And Billy Bob Thornton big things. wrote the script. He had won an Oscar for yeah, writing for freaking Sling Blade. Sling Blade. Yep. So, um, so this movie was only made for $10 million. This was obviously a strange labor of love for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. And um, and Sam Raimi had... was a. He was just about to do Spider-Man. Spider-Man, right? So he was yeah. on the cusp. These people were all on the cusp or had already done... But, In fact, Keanu but was the biggest name. he's already a celebrated... Yeah. I, I think maybe the reason why Sam Raimi gets forgotten for this movie is that he still... This was like... This, movie's this was his first step into, like, I'm going to make regular mainstream, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more mainstream type films. Mm -hmm. And it's despite the fact that this has, like, a small sort of paranormal element to the movie, it's his first step is sort of, like, watering down the yeah. San, Bra so, San Raimi craziness. And, and you could tell that, you know, Billy Bob Thornton, he wrote this, he co-wrote this with uh, Tom Epperson. Oh. Um, you could tell that he was trying to do another Southern Gothic style film. How he, like, he was trying to recapture the lightning in the bottle that was Sling Blade into this story. And apparently, I'm just learning this, this movie was based on the alleged psychic experiences of Billy Bob's mom. Whoa! So Billy Bob's mom was a psychic lady. I buy this. And so he made I buy a, this a thousand percent. I found out about Billy Bob, This yeah. is his life story. This is his life story. I take it 100%. Um, I take it, yeah. And so um, it was $10 million, but it made $44.6 million in the box office. That sounds like a hit to me. That's not too bad. It did not do very well with the critics. It kind of got mixed reviews. Um, they said that it was pretty basic and conventional. And it, I agree. It I, is. It is basically. It is basic and conventional, but it executes perfectly. Yeah. It hits all the beats you it want does it to what hit. It needs to do. Yeah. It's got such an amazing cast, giving these fun Billy Bob Thornton performances. I want every gun we have to fire on that man. Woo! An all Star Wars podcast brought to you by the Moon Gas Family. Enjoy the moon. Um, hi, Let's I'm blow this puppy and go home. Oh, wait. <laughs> Salt. Ground forces incoming. Get help, you're no match for him. He's a Sith Lord. Chancellor Palpatine, Sith Lords are our speciality. <laughs> It was a time of great unrest. The so-called true Star Wars fans had emerged. They descended like the vermin they were. Only Danielle and Steven had faith to rally the good forces against these insufferable odds. Good. Rebel Order, and the Rebel Order is our Star Wars podcast that is dedicated to what we feel the mix of Episode 9 will be, which is a little bit of dark, a little First Order, mixing with a little light, a little rebellion, a little resistance.
He's talking about balance. To create a balance, a balance. new yeah. entity in and of itself. Exactly. Maybe it'll be this podcast soon. Exactly. Kill him. Kill him now. I'm being torn apart. I want to be free of this pain. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Raylo for life. Will you help me? Yes, anything. Subscribe to the Rebel Order and do it. Oh wait, we're Already? here. It's the beginning of the Chewy, episode. we're home. Yeah, exactly. Boom. <laughs> you did well. And we're back! Okay, quickly into the plot. Quick synopsis. A plot. A basic non reveal plot synopsis. Is like, go, go, you do. Okay. Um, it is about a woman um, who has two children. Her husband died in a factory accident. Um, and she now supports her family through um, giving readings. And she has her own special set of like fortune telling cards. And she basically helps... That look like the cards from, like, go, like Ghostbusters. Yeah. The intro to Ghostbusters. Um, and she she basically just um, helped... He, she supports her family by doing this, uh, having this gift. And she gets... Obviously, her life gets complicated when the people that she's helping, their lives entangle in her lives, and a murder happens, and then she has to sort of help And the, it. the cops come and ask her to... Yeah. To help out, because she knows... Yeah. A lot of the basically all the problems of the women of the community, and sort of. and um, it's a it's a it's a movie. Kind of, it's it's it, that's the premise of the sort of solving the murder plot, but really it's also about the people in the town and that she helps, and how this town sort of is in the southern gothic style have a lot of dirty secrets and a lot of pain, a lot of pain that she's and helping dark people things. deal with. Yeah, and so. Um, yeah, and so it's sad because you can see in some of the characters, she's like the only therapist they have, mm -hmm. and she's really not a therapist. She's just somebody who Is tells empathic. you, like, yeah, and to, who can tell you maybe how something's going to happen in your future. No, and she's empathetic. She's, yeah. she's willing to But be... she's not a professional psychiatrist, mm -hmm. psychologist, so it's tough for her to know how to help people, and, and so she, also, she makes mistakes. It's extremely just a fantastic performance by Kate Blanchett because she's also dealing with the loss of her husband mm -hmm. while she's dealing with all these other people. And she's not dealing with her in grief. pain. And yeah. then also since it has that whole Southern Gothic thing, she is also judged <laughs> yeah. by everyone in the community. For being So a half witch. the fun of the movie is yeah. Keanu Reeves calling her a, witch. a Satan worshiper. She's a Satan worshiper <laughs> witch. Um okay, so here's the thing. I was attracted to this movie because obviously Kate Blanchett and Keanu Reeves. Actually more Keanu Reeves than Kate Blanchett. I'm, I'm gonna be frank, I'm gonna be super frank. I really wanted to bang Keanu Reeves at the time. I was like, um, Keanu Reeves, you are the most handsome man I still, in this I still town. Wanna, I still want to bang Keanu Reeves. Um, but yeah, so I was attracted to both Kate Blanchett and, and Katie Holmes and stuff like that. And so, and I really also, at the time in high school, I loved, I really got into Southern Gothic as mm -hmm. a genre. Um, we read... Um, Carson McCullers and, and stuff like that in my school. Does Anne Rice count as Southern? No. No? She's different. She has Southern elements, but she's not Southern Gothic. Okay. Southern Gothic tends to be a very specific thing um, about, like... True blood. Yeah. It's meant to... But it's meant to be, like, dark and twisty, but only the way that the South can do it, you know? So, like, lots of... Well, a little of, bit of racism and yeah, Southern Yeah, lots of stuff. Lots of, lots yeah. of kind of seedy secrets mm -hmm. and, and Bible Belt sort of pushing mm -hmm. strangeness and... Devils and But also and, yeah. the combination of, like, people living in, like, the, the backwoods, so they tend to have their own sort of cultural, like, you know, like, witchcraft or different practices that they're doing, um, Gullah people, you know, stuff like that. So it's all very genre esque, and so I and I actually when in studying Southern Gothic in my call in my high school, I'm sorry, we watched Sling, Sling Blade, because um, my teacher said this was a really good example of Southern Gothic done um, on film. Um, we also read um, what's his name William Faulkner, who's mm -hmm. in, who's like the ace of Southern uh -huh. Gothic, um, and so I had so I was also also into that. Now, I don't think I was attracted to this movie because I knew it was written by Billy Bob Thornton. I just thought, oh, Southern Gothic-y thing, I like it, I want to watch it. 
Um, and then that's why I saw it. And I, I really ended up liking this movie. I've seen this movie at least four times. I don't know why. There's just well, something about it that really appeals to me. My mother so, for years had been telling me to watch this movie. Yeah? And I and I, I remember now, and when I, I talked think, to her about it, she was like, I told you to watch it. I think that just there's an attraction for women, because it's like a, even though it's not really, it doesn't pass a Bechdel test. It's not a fair... It's not... And yeah. it is, you can tell it is written by a man and yeah. directed by a man. It's, but there's also a sense, it's, I think Sam Raimi has Like, a, there's two, yeah. I would say, like, there's her and her neighbor yeah. are both, like, really positive, good mm -hmm. female characters, even though her neighbor is just like, oh, yeah, I'll take care of the kids. Mm -hmm. well, but but yeah. all the other women in the film, Hilary Swank and Katie Holmes... They tend to be a little caricature -esque. Very cliche. They're, car they're caricatures. They're one like, note. Yeah, they're very one note. Um, but so are a lot of the men. So I think that that's kind of like... I feel like... Uh, mm, Donnie Barksdale is a one-note piece of shit. Yeah, but like... What's his, uh, J.K. Simmons' character as yeah. a detective. And that's part of the fun of the movie, too. Yeah. Is watching J.K. Simmons and Aunt May in a Sam Raimi movie before they get to be inspired Spider-Man. You, you, do, you do really um, get the... You do really get the horror Madonna dichotomy going in this film. Because it's basically like... You know, you're either Kate Blanchett, who, yes, she may see the future, but she's super, vir like, essentially virginal again, because her husband died, so she's very, like, I raised my children and I'm good. And then you have Katie Holmes, who is the spoiled little rich southern girl who's bored, and so she wanders around in the backwood bars, fucking every roughneck she can find. Gary Coles. Like it's Gary Coles in it. Southern lawyer. Yeah, oh, exactly, man. yeah. It's got a lot of that. And she's she's banging everybody. Like Katie Holmes. So Katie Holmes' character, she she basically gets into trouble because she's promiscuous. That's sort of the commentary yes. they're making here. Um, and it's not sort of. It is the commentary they're making here. She gets in trouble because she's promiscuous, because she's bored, and because she doesn't... She doesn't. She wants to escape sort of her boring life, and then you have like the perpetual victim of Hillary Swank. Hillary Swank, by the way, wearing the most hilarious wig you've ever yeah. seen. I don't think it was a wig. I think it was extensions in her in her short hair, really? because she has this ridiculous mullet, guys. When I tell you, ridiculous. She was leaning into the character. Yeah, she was leaning heavily into. She was the like, character. I don't want anyone to mistake me for the next she Karate wore, Kid. She wore full denim most of the time and she had this ridiculous mullet and then her husband was Donnie Barksdale played by none other than Keanu Reeves. She just Reeves. can't quit him. Yeah, she just can't quit him. Keanu Reeves plays the very abusive, angry man of the town but he gets around because he looks like Keanu Reeves. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> and when we were, I was re-watching it with Steven and what did I say? I said, the only reason that he gets away with what he gets away with is because he looks like Keanu Reeves. And yeah. then didn't you find an interview? Yes, I have an interview with uh, <laughs> Sam Raimi that <laughs> I'll cut into this part of the episode yeah. where Sam Raimi was just like, we had to cast Keanu Reeves. Yeah. First name that came to my mind, Keanu Reeves. I, I was uh, caught into believing the media's portrayal of him and the movie's portrayal of him, portrayal of him as a nice guy, uh, a guy who was... Um, you know, kind of goofy and funny, but it's just a character like any other actor creates. And when I met him, I realized that he's really a craftsman, an actor, and he's dedicated and really had a very intelligent take on the role of Donnie Barksdale. And uh, when I thought about him, more and more he became more right for the piece. Tom Rosenberg, my producer, always insisted he would be perfect, and it turned out that he was right because as I thought about Keanu as the villain, he has a sexuality to him that another villain wouldn't have had. And to think about why Hilary Swank's character stays in the relationship with Keanu, it's not just that she's caught in a cycle of abuse, but this guy is sexy, he's good looking, and she digs him. So I understand that. And um, it's not pleasant, but it's probably true. And I also understood why Katie Holmes' character, thinking about Keanu Reeves playing the part that is, why Katie Holmes' character would cross the track, so to speak, come down to his poor side of town and hang with him because he's good looking, he's a babe. And um, it suddenly added another dimension to the picture that I thought was right. And it was unexpected and real. And so suddenly it was a great, great casting choice. Because it sells the whole movie. Mm -hmm. 
as to why everyone would stay with him and or bang him, yeah. be attracted to him because in he, his little town. Because he has he is no, the Keanu Reeves. Yeah, he has no other. He's roots. beautiful. He's no other redeeming qualities other than his face and his dick. I'm telling you right now, that's it. Because this character is he's so, a good Christian man. Yeah, don't he, lie. But it's so broadly written. He tries hard. He's so stereotypical. He's just a he's he's abusive. I like to imagine he's an asshole. I, I like I, everything. It's my head canon, Billy Bob Thornton wrote that role for himself because he was yeah. like, I'm gonna make out with Katie Holmes. And I'm gonna make like, out with Hillary Swank and touch yeah. her big bosoms. Yeah. And then there were awesome. and, then, and then Sam Raimi was like, Hey uh Billy, hey, I don't Billy. think that all these women would really wanna bang you be Billy. into the sling blade guy. Yeah. So <laughs> We're gonna get that cute boy from the Bill and Ted films yeah. for this part, okay? <laughs> We're gonna get the Matrix kid. Um, he grew his hair out. Keanu is looking real good in this movie too, because he grew his hair out. Uh, he had a beard. And he has like a lumberjacky sort of and redneck this was like aesthetic. Around the time that he was doing sort, of, I think he was trying to break out of the Matrix. So he was doing because he did another movie too where he played a serial killer, The Watcher. Yeah. And that was also not very good. Yeah. And then he followed that up with some like romantic. Uh... Yeah, so like, he was, <laughs> he, was to, he was going everywhere. He was trying to bust out of the Matrix because yeah. he didn't want to be typecast into this sort of like neo role. Savior role. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, he wasn't interested, but he yeah. So he did this movie. Um, and so I would say this movie is actually worth a watch to me, and I think it's good to be revisited. And I feel like as we were watching the movie, Stephen and I sort of both had this epiphany at the same time that this would become a really excellent TV series. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because the one thing that Be Billy Bob does very successfully, us, you know, the the murder by numbers plot gets kind of he built conventional, a good world. but he built a really interesting world. And I think that in 2019, you could really play a lot with the female characters. Yeah, for eight, and for if you had 8 episodes of this show? Yeah. Set in this, you know, creepy yeah. little town, and mm -hmm. everybody's got problems. And, 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 and supernatural stuff. She's got stuff. some supernatural powers yeah. that could help her. Supernatural stuff help has people. such a resurgence, and especially witchcraft and women, and witchcraft mm -hmm. and women, and like having, you know, craft mm -hmm. and and, and like this psychic would, energy and stuff. This would be a great effects show. It would. It would be a really cool show, I think, and especially the Southern Gothic style, because we've seen True Detective mm -hmm. was so was very the first season was very successful because of that Southern Gothic vibe that it was giving off. And then people love Southern Gothic. They love to play with the twisty, weird world of like the Deep South that no and, one understands. And, and the way the film really sets up her character, and the way it shows her interaction with Giovanni Ribisi and stuff, mm -hmm. you could do like oh, we haven't even talked about him. You yet. could do like a by the week, like you know, each week you explore a new character, yeah. and someone else gets to have like an amazing performance. Yeah. you know what I mean. As they're dealing yeah. with. I, have, I do. I, I obviously don't know. I, I think they've sort of forgotten about this film. I don't think anyone who's produced it is really interested in in trying to make it anything. Yeah. But really, we should kickstart the rights back, right? Right. Yeah. Sure. How <laughs> Guys, if you want to help kickstart the rights back, yeah. To us. But it honestly <laughs> could be a really cool TV show. You could do a lot of slice of life stories. You could do a murder mystery story. She could assist with. Like, it could become like a murder she wrote esque thing. Or she helps to solve murders or whatever. You could take, you could jump time, or you could take place in, in this time period. But her kids could be more older, so that she could be dealing with that. Like if her boys are now teenagers, and you know what I mean, like because they. Also, you would take Kate Blanchett. You'd just move the timeline a little forward. I would move the timeline a little forward. So, so that that would be that this movie would be the pilot yeah. for the show. I would age, Whoa, yeah. She, gets, I would, she brings back Kate Blanchett. I would, I would age it up. I would. No, I would just go home the cast. You go home the cast. You just reboot first. I will go straight. Because that way, like, you can touch yeah. some of these. Yeah, I guess you're right. You could touch, like, this could be the, you could touch this this plot, like, you know, mm -hmm. throughout the eight episodes, but not, you know, be dedicated not, to it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so, and because Stephen brought up the potential for interesting stories, the, one of the more fascinating characters and fascinating plot lines in this movie is Giovanni Ribisi um, plays a mechanic who relies on Kate Blanchett's character to his, help like, him get through because he basically she's basically his psychologist yeah, yeah he is struggling he has a lot of mental um health issues he drinks he can't he's unstable he's unstable he has he's prone to violent outbursts and buddy cole is his character's name Kate blanchett's name is annie buddy. annabelle annie wilson mm -hmm. um and buddy is really having a tough time and they they do a really horrifying but very effective payoff with his story. So he comes to 
I guess, do you want to give a spoiler alert? Because do we want to talk about this more? All right, yo, not? we're going to get into the deepest spoilers. We've only been mm-hmm. light spoilering. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you want to not know the twist of uh, the gift, uh, peace out right here. And then it's come on back. Pro- Amazon Prime right now if you're interested in watching And then probably come back it. in like five minutes because I don't think Danny expected to talk 30 minutes about a film from 2001. I didn't. But when the film 2001 is dope, it's like easy. So. Well, I liked it. I like this movie. Long before you like You love Donnie Barksdale. Mm, yeah, sure. Spoilers, spoilers. These are the spoilers for Donnie Barksdale. <laughs> Film no. The Gift. Yeah, uh huh. Donnie Barksdale film The Gift. <laughs> That'd be like, the worst way to sell it. This is about Donnie Barksdale. No, it's not. Um, so <laughs> that, that's how we rebrand the show. It's not called The Gift. It's called The Trial of Donnie Barksdale. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's free. Uh, so Buddy, Buddy story. Um, supports Annie's Cape Blanchett, Annie's main story. Um. So but he he comes to her. I think it's just he comes to her and he says that he's seeing a blue diamond when he has nightmares of a yeah. blue diamond. Well, and just the way they unveil his whole plot yeah. is like perfect. Yeah. Because she comes to him, her car's messing up. Yeah. You immediately build the relationship. Yeah. Because he's like, you don't have to pay me. I know shit's tight. Yeah. And then he drives her where she needs to be. And they're talking. And yeah. she, you see him have a whole episode. Yeah. And how she gets him to come back and what his problem is that if he sees the blue diamond and he thinks yeah. negative thoughts he's gonna have to kill himself yeah and so and he, he's suicidal so the whole time you just you 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 what's great about the movie is it lies to you and makes you think this guy is just nuts this guy is just he just has, has no a screw loose yeah. he doesn't have a, he just he all he has is this poor woman but he's really like he's nuts and he's dragging her down and he has a great hero moment yeah unfortunately for for her He's sort of he's he's a good narrative thing because he's the reason why Annie, as a character, ends up getting herself into trouble. Mm-hmm. But and and why she puts herself out there because he is her failing. Because what starts to happen is as the plot starts to unravel and Katie Holmes' character goes missing and then she winds up dead. Annie's very preoccupied with that case and that story and. Um, she doesn't pay attention to Buddy really crying out for help in a terrible way until he calls her and she sees him. Well, with, right before that, yeah, the movie gives him like an awesome hero moment. Yeah. Oh yeah. Where yeah. her children are are being threatened by Donnie Barksdale, by Keanu beautiful Reeves. Keanu Reeves. Because Donnie the thing Barksdale. is, Keanu Reeves, Donnie Barksdale's wife, keeps going to Annie for readings, and he's like, and she keeps telling Annie. I mean, Annie keeps telling his wife. Leave him. He's gonna beat you to death. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean. And then he gets pissed off about that. He's like, "Don't tell my wife what to do." So he's threatening her, and yeah. he starts threatening his kids. Her kids. And all of a sudden, Buddy shows up. Mm-hmm. As soon as he says that he would kill her mm-hmm. for 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 telling him this, and Buddy uses all of his crazy powers. Yeah. And beats the shit he out of his car. The and shit scares out of the Donnie shot Barksdale and his and friends. And Donnie Barksdale puts a gun to his head. And Gianna V. Serbizzi just yells, shoot me. Yeah. Like a million times in the most believable, like horrifying, like I'll kill you right back so hard and you'll go to jail and this would be the ultimate way to protect her. Exactly. If you killed me in cold blood right here, you, I would be protecting her so perfectly. And getting myself out of the way. putting you in jail. Yeah. And taking care of all of our problems. Just do it, you Mm -hmm. dumb piece of shit. Yeah. And then to see him at that level again and Mm -hmm. finally being able to... Get revenge. Yeah. On his own father. That's the oh, twist. Man. So, it is so horrifying because basically, like, the whole time he keeps talking about a blue diamond, blue diamond, blue diamond. And I stare into the blue diamond and I'll think negative thoughts. Diamond, I'll think negative thoughts. And then it gets more twisty because at one point he tells her, When I think about my father, I touch myself. What the fuck is the matter with me? Mm-hmm. And she's just kind of like, buddy, I can't help you. She, she, she doesn't feels, understand. She doesn't understand, and she also feels very hurt. She doesn't know what to do, so she kind of pushes him away. Then he calls her. She's got the guilt of dealing with all yeah. her own problems. She too. shows up to his house. He's got his father tied to a chair. Her his mother's, her mother's his watching. Mother's from watching flipping, out. flipping out. He beats his dad with a belt, and then he sets his father on fire. And as she stares in horror at her, his father in flames... He tells her, look at that thing. Look at it. Don't tell me. Don't tell me you wouldn't 
Take do it too. Yeah. And then you see there is a diamond tattoo over his father's belly button. Like he was like a veteran or something. And like, like a I don't know what the fuck. Yeah. And it's, and it's all sweaty and nasty. Yeah. And so you realize. That was Sam Raimi. Like, yeah. you need the grossest belly button yeah. in the world. We need right the nastiest, here. hairiest <laughs> belly button. And then that's when you realize that he was being sexually abused by forever. his father. Mm -hmm. His mother did nothing. And so he had nightmares and he basically had com completely twisted. And so unfortunately, you know, he is committed to a mental institution and that kind of spurs Annie to finish the plot of the story, which becomes more conventional and more boring because she kind of like pulls her, oh, I'm going to help solve the murder. Because at first they point fingers at Donnie Barksdale for the murder of Katie Holmes' character, but then she starts to get clues that it wasn't him and that he... It was the worst character in the film. Yeah. Greg Kinnear. It ends up being Greg Kinnear. The guy. The from, boring guy. As soon as you we see him, you're like, he's the killer. That's 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 kind of the failing of the movie, unfortunately. Like, you can kind of see, like, like I said, there's some parts of this movie that are so effective and really interesting, and then there's other parts that become, that are just so by the numbers, boring, that you're like, oh, okay, like that, it, it, you don't care about that plot line. Mm -hmm. And they tr they attempt to make it more interesting by they try to give Greg Kinnear this attraction to Kate Blanchett's character, and like they might have a forbidden romance, but they never push it far enough, mm -hmm. and so it's never as interesting enough to like compromise her emotionally that she would be like, oh yeah, you know this guy, and then so when he tries to kill her, it's like a big deal, and like because she ends up seeing the truth, which is he killed Katie Holmes because he was tired of her running around town. Fucking other guys. Yeah. And then really the, the dope end. movie magic twist yeah. of the whole film, which maybe this film also suffers too from like being so close to the sixth sense. Yeah, magical you know, realism, I guess. Yeah. Being close to the sixth sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. ghosts helping you out in the plot. Yeah. You know, is yeah. a sort of a thing. It's and a, counseling, yeah. mental health counseling, there's similar themes going on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, uh, basically, like the ghost that she talks to can also. Physically, physically affect her yeah. in the world, and that becomes useful and yeah. is a good hero moment. Yeah, not total spoilers. Wow. Yeah, not total spoilers. But um, I, I think yeah, I think so. this movie is worth a watch. It does sort of. You saw lose, it on Amazon Prime. It does. I said I said that. We did. Yes, I did. Sorry. It does sort of lose its way, and it does become sort of a generic crime thriller. But there is a lot of meat to this story, and like I and like we were saying, I think that if you ever wanted to explore this narrative again, and I know nobody else cares but us, but I think it would be cool to do a TV show about it. I think it would be cool to explore the narrative of this character, and all the people in the town and the women in the town. I think that it would be a really fun, uh, short, uh, limited series. So come on, someone pay us. Let's go do it. I'll go move to we'll freaking Louisiana booth. I'll Let's I'll write some uh, I'll I'll fucking I'll spec script some shit. I'll do it. I'll Let's fucking go. do it. Let's write some fan I'll food. fucking develop it, man. Okay. So uh next topic out of the spoiler zone. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> we saw the Rebel Wilson film, Isn't It Romantic, the romantic comedy. Um I felt a duty to talk about support it support a larger person starring in a mainstream Hollywood film yes. that actually gets released to theaters. Yes. So I think it's our duty as people who... To talk about it? To... Yeah, talk about it. All right, sure. I, and I enjoyed it. I actually, I very much enjoyed it. So I had very we, low expectations for yeah, it. Yeah, that's why we have very low expectations. And I'm going to pay for it. Yeah. So we're about to well, give away we our secrets right now. Technically, I don't... Well, not, you want me to not give away the no, secrets? No, go ahead. Go for it. Do it. Just go ahead and... Uh, Look up proxy servers. Uh, there you go. And let's say that people in France are enjoying this film in their homes. And people in the United States have to pay for it in the theaters. That's all. <laughs> well, we will pay for it because AMC stuff lets us pay for movies. Exactly. So, so isn't it romantic? I it hasn't made a ton of waves here. I think it was sort of middling. It's reviewed. no, it's, it was still making money though. Yeah, but it was, it still, was but yeah. it wasn't really getting. It wasn't. I think. It got overshadowed it got by in the top 10. Captain it's, Marvel. Unfortunately, there is several female-led films that are all yeah. busting out here in February. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Alita Battle Angel, Captain yeah. Marvel. Um, there was another one, too. Which is good. 
It is good. I'm just saying that the yeah. competition is... The the Rotten Tomatoes consensus was actually 70%, which is pretty, that's fresh. Mm -hmm. And it said the consensus is it follows as many genre conventions as it mocks, but isn't it romantic as a feel-good rom-com with some satirical bite and a star well-suited for both? I'd say yeah. That's pretty I, accurate. That's pretty accurate. Rebel Sometimes, Wilson is whoever writes those Rotten Tomato consensuses... That's the real critic right there. I'm He's serious. The master. Whoever that is, that person is the genius. That person is the one. Because those consensus, I sometimes agree with those consensus more than I agree with all the different reviews that I read. And obviously they're aggregating and, mm -hmm. and pulling from all the reviews, but they do it in a very fair and balanced way. Mm -hmm. There's always something positive and then something negative. You know what I mean? Unless the movie is so badly reviewed. That there's like almost nothing positive yeah. they can say about it. Like John Travolta's Gotti. <laughs> Which was directed by, do you know? No, I don't know. By Kevin Connolly, that guy from Entourage, the E. Oh, yeah, yeah, e? yeah. E directed that movie, yes. Okay, well, I hated Entourage and I never watched it, so there you go. That's yeah. the extent of the talent that I felt. Well, that guy was also in that horrible uh, Married with Children wannabe show. What was it called? The one with the bunny by Bob Cat Galway that I read was called. The one with anyway. Nikki Cox. She's so beautiful in that show. Yeah, she's Isn't it romantic? Isn't it romantic? Rebel Wilson is, I like her character. a romantic comedy satire, or attempting to be, about a girl who is very cynical about the idea of love. Because she's a plus-size girl. Her mother told her women that look like us, who are bigger, mm -hmm. who are not conventionally, like, super attractive, mm -hmm. um, don't have love stories like... Notting Hill or Pretty Woman. Plus, they geez. they just, you know, they live their lives and they die alone, I guess, is what her mother was trying to tell her, which is really horrible. And mm -hmm. so she grows up absorbing that mentality, and so she feels very, um, bleh about love. And she is working in a... She's an architect. As an architect in a very, like, male-dominated so environment. Okay, so here's what I really enjoyed about this film. Um... They take all the conventions of a romantic comedy and put them in a realistic term. So, like, what would... Because there are tons of rom-coms where, like, a woman mm -hmm. is, like, an architect and she works in a fancy-ass office. Yeah. And she's pretty, like, you know what I mean? They're always working these... Mm -hmm. They make these jobs look super glamorous, but, like, the reality of it looks way different most yeah. of the time than what I, they're trying to portray I, in the films. I like that the movie had this, you know, Matrix aesthetic where... Yeah. Her real world has a certain color, color palette tone, yeah. and grossness mm -hmm. and sort of realism to it. And then the fake world has like this full on Hollywood yeah. fairy tale yeah. aesthetic. Yeah. And in seeing the contrast between how it's depicted in romantic comedies and how it is more like real life in her sad world. Mm -hmm. Um there you see the, you know, the, Rebe, the weaknesses yeah, and Rebe, of where reality falls in between. And Rebe, Rebel Wilson is a funny chick, and I really appreciate her. And I appreciate what this film was trying to do in that way. In that it was trying to, the message is, even though, yes, the world is not a romantic comedy, you should still open yourself to the possibility of love, because you can still be loved, and you can love yourself, and other people will love you for being yourself. And you don't mm -hmm. have to fulfill this sort of and fantasy also, stereotype. the trappings of your life yeah. are not as horrible as, you know, as they appear sometimes. Sometimes. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, like, in real life, you don't have to have, like, a woman who is your nemesis. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You and... don't have to have... No, but, yeah, but you can subvert those tropes mm -hmm. in the film. And, and, I, and, I, and I think... I do appreciate what they're trying to do in that respect. But you can also see, and as the consensus says, but this is the truth. In order to tell a story where two people fall in love and it's a comedy and it's romantic, you end up falling into the genre tropes. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I really don't. Mm -hmm. Because they work. But it's also, it is a little tough to swallow the transition when you're so cynical at the beginning about like, I guess what they were trying to say is that she sh that sh she shouldn't embrace the cynicism and instead kind of allow those tropes to invade her life just a little bit to find happiness with somebody in her real life. You know what I mean? And 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 they did try to use sort of that moment where she's in the romantic comedy portion of her life to sort of say, okay, 
I actually don't need any of this like fake friffy stuff. I really just need to learn to self-love myself. You know what I mean? I need to learn that I am worthy of love. And then once I know that, I can go out into the world and I can, and people that I may actually be attracted to or think are a good fit for me, I'll sort of put that together and I'll, and that'll work out, you know, without, without giving away too many spoilers. Um, so, I mean, okay, to crit, I would have a critique. My... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Are you going to go to negative work, bro? No, I was just going to have, like, one critique. Go for it. <sighs> okay. No, about to. They love this fucking guy, Adam Devine. That's the actor mm -hmm. that plays Rebel, Wales, Re 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 Rebel Wilson's love interest in the film. They love this guy. They use him everywhere. And I think, for me, he's a little bit off-putting. He's a sweet, doofy dude, so I see why they like to use him in things like this. <sighs> But I also feel um, that he's a little off-putting. Um, my, my, my thing is, is I feel like he's an actor that I want in a movie in a small way. Yes. Okay? There it is. If he's a cutaway, if he's in one scene, if he's for one moment of the movie or yeah. a couple moments of the movie, I'll accept it. Yeah. But when he has to carry, for yeah. me, a quarter to half of the film... And especially, like, a very important... Like, and this isn't the first time Rob Wilson, think... Rob Wilson and he worked together. They were yeah. also in Pitch Perfect together. Mm -hmm. He played Bumper. He played a freaky frat guy. Because yeah. he has that kind of face and that kind of, like, persona. Mm -hmm. That bro-ish... Yeah, that bro -ish tone. And he was also um, in that movie about the dates or whatever. Mike know. and Dave need wedding dates. Yeah, I don't like that movie. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I just... I, I think for me... Maybe it's, it's also just his comedic... Delivery I, I is more like television aesthetic yeah, to me than it, film. Yeah, yeah. I, don't know. I feel bad saying that, but I just really. Yeah. That I think the problem is for me. I kind of felt like it's not that I think that she should have been with someone. What I perceive, what you would say, is hotter, or do, I just I wanted a different kind of character. I was. I would have. I would actually appreciate. And here's my thing that I'm sort of like as a as a big person. Why can't she fall in love with a big dude? Yeah, the chubby And guy. I'm not saying, yeah, I and and I, it's not that I'm saying that skinny people or skinnier people and bigger people can't be together. That's bullshit. It happens all the time. But in Hollywood, it's almost kind of like they're saying you can't have two fat people fall in love. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? No like somebody's to gotta be thin. No enough. one wants to see two fat people. Kiss. Someone's gotta be thin enough to be conventionally acceptable enough so that if she, they're the bigger one, you have to focus on that. And yet, for this movie. They don't have like any fat phobia, not really. No one is no one made any comments about her weight or the fact that she eats. No, they didn't. No mm -hmm. one made no there was and that that was very blissfully nice for me to not have that fat phobia. Like obviously they implied that she's they just not as attractive. Food, but... Yeah, that's not the same thing. Well, and, and obviously they're implying or she's implying to herself that she's not as attractive because she's bigger and because she's not conventionally like thinner and, and with a certain look but at the same time everyone around her don't they don't make fat phobic comments which I felt very refreshing however then that's kind of like if you're doing that then why not have her fall in love with a big guy, bigger guy and this is the thing there are so many bigger men that just look like lumberjacks of sexiness like big you know broader shoulders or like you can find a really cute bigger dude mm -hmm. and the, just the very simple fact that he's bigger and so i guess I, yeah i think it bothered me because i know they're picking this guy because adam divine is like the perfect normal looking guy for rebel wilson to fall in love with in the real world he's attractive enough that it's not like thing but he's not so attractive that it feels like a fantasy yeah, because yeah. it's not liam hemsworth but i want i want a chubby dude <laughs> i why can't chubby dudes get love? And then the problem with it is, if you make a movie with a chubby dude falling in love, they always have to fall in love with a model because it's written by a man and it's wish fulfillment. Yeah. And then if you have these movies, it's all... I like the attempt that they made to have her fall in love with someone who looked pretty normal. You know what I mean? Even though Rebel Wilson and Adam Vine are still attractive actors, mm -hmm. they are not unattractive people just because they don't look like fucking... No, Rebel Wilson's hot. Mm -hmm. Rebel Wilson's very pretty. She's beautiful. She's got a beautiful... She's got a beautiful face. She's got beautiful hair. She's got big, f f f delicious bosoms. She's an attractive... Bosoms. Bosoms. She's an attractive woman, okay? And Adam Devine is not a bad-looking dude. He is a... He is actor normal, okay? Which is still... 
for the average person, ten times more attractive than yeah, the yeah, average person. For sure. And I'm and I am not gonna watch start an argument with you should attract you should only cast average looking people, real average looking people in movies. That's not what I'm trying to say. I know movies are fantasies. I know movies even when we cast quote unquote ugly people, they're like the prettiest version of ugly people we can find. You know what I mean? I know that. Movies are fantasies, okay? We want to see, like, the best mm -hmm. version of ourselves, even when they're ugly. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm using air quotes because, you know, it's subjective. Yeah. But, um, but I still <coughs> then think, push the boundary a little bit more and have him be chubby. Cast, find a new person. Find a... Why... That's the other thing, too, that I, I bothers me. Romantic comedies used to... Like, sometimes they would star really big actors, right? But sometimes they would try to find... New faces. Quirky people. New faces. New new it people. New hot boys. New hot girls. You know what I mean? Excuse me. Why, if you heard me burp, I'm sorry. Why can't we find a new it boy? Like, a new cute, chubby yeah. boy that's like, put him in a movie. And then, then you subvert the trope because you have two chubby people falling in love with each other. And you don't have to have it be, he has to find... Catherine Heigl, and she has to find Liam Hemsworth to yeah. find each other, and it's really nice. That's like my one critique of and that. Like. His casting in the movie felt a little more glaring because yeah. all the other characters yeah. fit their characters very well. Even yeah. Liam Hemsworth, mm -hmm. he pulled off a very, you know, Richard Gere fantasy yes. sort of guy, and it played into the tropes of like. Here's a rich guy in a limousine who Just discovers you exactly. and yeah. do this, take you on an adventure. Mm -hmm. And it had uh, Priyanka Chopra, who we've loved for many years now. Yeah. Who was so in her element Dawn in this films. film. This was the great thing. There were several musical and dance numbers in this movie. And if you know anything about Priyanka Chopra's career, you know that... This girl and musicals... She's Bollywood ready. She's Bollywood, she's Bollywood stardom. Mm -hmm. Um, so this, I, so it's kind of funny to see everyone else sort of trying to keep up with her, but you can just see how, like, she's just so light years over people in terms of, like, I, this is what I'm built for. I'm built for singing and dancing <laughs> in a movie and telling a story. And, uh... For, and that worked very well for her character. And I think we can both agree that the, the highlight surprise breakout character of the film was Donnie, played by Brandon Scott Jones. Yes. Her gay neighbor. Her gay neighbor. Who, in the fantasy world, becomes that her was, gay best that friend. That was something very I really liked, that they played with the stereotype of the support of gay best friend in rom-coms that like only exist to support the main straight protagonist. Mm -hmm. That was great. And I really liked that they did that, and they sort of were very tricksy, because they managed... To make, <laughs> they managed to have. They walked the line. Oh, they walked the line because listen, there's still something very funny about a very <laughs> effeminate, gay over the top gay man um, being an all in a rom com and like literally only existing in a certain way. And you do laugh at that sort of like the over the topness that you know they're putting on a performance, mm -hmm. and. And but yet yeah, they they manage every time you were kind of like is this towing the line between offensive and satirical they turned it into satire because like the simple things they would do like for instance he would just turn up wherever she was yeah. like a gay fairy and, I was like, in the neighborhood. and I mean that not in an insult I mean like literally like Tinkerbell the fairy not yeah. like I don't don't I'm not saying in an insulting way I mean like literally like poof, here I am. Did you need some help with your love life, yeah. Rebel Wilson? Yeah. And so that became... Let's get on my scooter. Yeah. I was heading there anyway for no reason. Exactly. <laughs> and it became really funny because you it, it points out the sort of glaring stereotypes in other romantic comedies. That, yeah, the gay best friend only ever exists when the straight best friend needs help, needs advice with their love life. Other than that, they have no other storyline. They have no other plot points. They have no other development. And then, but then they turned it all in their head at the end. And this is a credit to the actor that played him. Because to kind of have to do this role and sort of give him any sort of emotional impact is tough. And he did, because there's this really beautiful moment right at the end. So Rebel Wilson, like, basically she hit her head and she's in a coma. And so in her coma, she's in this magical romantic fantasy land where everything is like a romantic comedy, everything looks beautiful and fancy, and now her gay neighbor, who never even talks to her, she didn't even know was gay, yeah, yeah. 
um, is or at least now, subconsciously, yeah, somehow she knew. <laughs> yeah, it's now her gay best friend stereotype in this in the show. And so right around the end, when she's starting to kind of come out of her coma and realizing, like, I don't want this perfect world. I don't, this this isn't what I want. I want to love myself and I want to to, to love who I love and blah, 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 blah. He, um... I don't want to be people's doormat. Yeah, yeah. He sits down with her and has this really, like, like poignant monologue about like love and like who he and it came out of freaking it was nowhere it was a great performance and so they found a way to humanize him and then of course what's funnily enough is once she pops out of her coma and she goes back to her apartment she finds out that he is gay he has a boyfriend but he's a pot dealer and he's a slacker he's like, he's like a slacker and he doesn't give a shit <laughs> and then yeah so and he's not so he's not quite as friendly <laughs> he's not quite as friendly um, but he's still cool. Yeah, but no, but I, I, I did. I really like the way they subverted those tropes um, with him. Um, I think they back, you know, they back and forth, and, and it is, it has an uneven thing. You can tell what they're trying to do. It's cute. I, it entertained me for an hour and a half. I really liked it in that way. Um, you know, the other thing I'm going to be frank. I think one of the reasons why I didn't really like Adam Delavine's casting is because I didn't feel that they had a lot of chemistry and I know that in mm -hmm. Pitch Perfect they were like they hooked up at one point but like it was meant to always be sort of weird because like they were both the yeah, weird characters like Fat ones. Amy yeah. and Bumper like those are their names mm -hmm. so it's okay for it to be off-putting in that way yeah, but when they're trying thing. to play a more conventional love story which is definitely what this was it kind of stuck out the lack of sort of chemistry she had with him. My thing is, like... Like, they had much more of a friend's... Fr friendistry than, like, sexual romantic chemistry. And I kind of wanted them to have... Like, you could see them trying to do it. They did the tropes. They had the I, moments. May, maybe they just felt that if they used Adam Devine, mm -hmm. they had a shorthand built into the audience. Yeah, I guess. That would automatically... Like, oh, these two people like, are going to, like, hook up. Like... Adam Devine, mm -hmm. oh, he's asking her out, he's desperate again, mm -hmm. he's that mm -hmm. character again, mm -hmm. and then it's supposed to be like a twist when he's the supportive, yeah. you know, yeah. sweet guy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It just, it's, I just, it, it just it doesn't have that chemistry. I just think that, yeah, they, Rebel Wilson... Like, even her, even her being, like, lusty for Liam Hemsworth was felt way more believable, yeah, believable yeah. than her legitimately being like, you're the love of my life. Yeah. Like, they were trying for like a When Harry Met Sally yeah. sort of thing, but, but it Harry, didn't work. But When Harry Met Sally... Had time. They had, and they had sexual chemistry. Billy Crystal mm -hmm. and Meg Ryan had sexual chemistry. Yeah, it's because Billy they Crystal did. wanted to... <laughs> because Billy Crystal, all, because they played at Enemies to Lovers. Mm -hmm. They didn't like each yeah, other, true. and then they became friends, yeah, that's why the and they always works. had... That's where the they were opposites works. attracting, yeah, remember? Because he friction. was like the feel, he yeah. was like the Oscar, and she was the Felix. You know yeah. what I mean? It was an odd couple, and so that's kind of the thing. Is that? Yeah, I and, and I think maybe where they could have saved it. Yeah, is if in her workplace, just like she is like in like a subjugated position. Yeah, she discounts him because he would ha hypothetically have been in like an equally shitty position in that yeah. office. Yeah. So maybe it's just like the toxic environment gets her to not pay attention to him. Would have worked better. I also, I really didn't like the use of friend zoning. Yeah. Because that's not a real thing and I hate it. Um, <laughs> it's bullshit. Um, and yes, her character um, is very oblivious. Like he's obviously attracted to her. You know what I mean? He asks her to come out. He asks her to do things. These are things that are signs. And she's very oblivious because she doesn't believe that she's worthy of love. And that's very sad. And you know that. But I don't like when her, like, her friend slash assistant is, like, your friend zoning him. Because, like, that's fucked. Like, what? And then you kind of have to look at it like, instead, I wish that they had, that moment had been less, had been written more. Instead of saying your friend zoning him, she could have said, like, do you not, like, is it that you don't? think that he's sexy or do you not are you not attracted to him you know what i mean mm -hmm. instead of putting it on her and making it because what if because if you're saying okay she's friend zoning him what if she wasn't really sexually attracted to him yeah and and the thing too is is what are you trying to do are you trying to push this love story that's why it's kind of like 
are you trying to push this love story between these two people because they just happen to be really good friends and then they should or be she's together? The, he's the only nice person yeah. left for her. Left like, for her. That's mm-hmm. kind of like how, that's where the movie starts or to Or they fall already apart. have the time together that yeah. they know each other and she's old or something? I don't that's know. where the movie starts to fall apart because the message is good that she needs to love herself to be loved, but then they had to kind of shoehorn in somebody that was already there so it'd be easy enough for her to like have a love story at the end so it still falls into the romantic comedy thing and then they're like, oh, well, here he is. You know what I mean? Now you know who it is. And you you, ever, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And I just, I, I don't know. Sometimes it reeked of that, like, you don't know you're beautiful. You know that kind of yeah, shit? Like, I don't yeah, like yeah. that. I really don't yeah. like that. I hate it. And it's Whoa. not that I don't think that, like, women obviously constantly undermine themselves and their bodies and their appearances. I do it all the fucking time. Steven hates it. I know every woman in my, in my life... You don't know you're beautiful. Shut up. You, I, it's, it's not that I don't think that... I understand that women do have self-esteem issues brought on by, like, those feelings in society. It's just more that I hate when it feels like, oh, a man telling you how beautiful you are. Mm-hmm. And so I do like that she kind of realized it before he realized it, so that it was sort of okay. Mm-hmm. But it still sort of started to feel in that kind of range of... Because he was always the one, you don't know how talented you are. Yeah. You're so special. You're so talented. You're so yeah. special. You're so talented. And, yeah, and I guess for me... They're going for a world in which is more realistic, right? Versus a world in the incident romantic land that when she gets into her coma, that's more idealistic and more romanticized and more conven- like rom com y tropey. But in realism world, mm-hmm. most, I don't know, people pay you compliments when they like you, but not like, like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I almost wish that it had been a more. Well, the whole movie is the whole movie even in the but the whole movie even in the real world is still stylized. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm asking for too much. Her dog doesn't, you know, let him let her pet him. Like, you know. Yeah. It's no, and then yeah, it is. It's it's still a character. I'm saying it's both. It's both extremes on either Mm -hmm. side because it's almost like the Charlie Brown world versus like Mm -hmm. the non Charlie Brown world. But I think that it's in her perspective. Yeah. Because when she gets back, it's like a bit of a middle because now she's yeah comfortable with herself but there are, and I thought that was the most effective part very, of the movie they're very still broad it, it is yeah. was her Perspective finding changing. her own self confidence yeah, exactly. in being an architect yeah. and then also showing the realities of being an architect versus yeah. not being an architect yeah. and then also just a very real corporate environment of like how hard it is to like pitch something yeah. sometimes in a room full of people yeah. when and you know people discount that. you and etc yeah. I don't know about being discounted I'm, I'm, I'm an ace I'm an ace I'm cool. But you know how hard it is to pitch. Yeah, totally. No, and I, I guess, yeah, you're right. It, both sides of the movie were painted with pretty broad strokes. Because, yeah, like, the way that she's treated in the beginning doesn't feel, like, at all. Like, I don't know. It just doesn't... I, I think I'm asking too much of this film. I think I just wanted... But I think that you're asking too much of this film because it has a possibility of really breaking new ground. Yeah. It's got a fucking... A lead woman... Who's over probably 180 pounds? It's like, yes. w- or 150 pounds. I don't know how big she is, but yeah. she looks like delicious to me. Mm-hmm. But to Middle America, they don't see that on a movie yeah. poster center stage for an hour and a half yeah. every week, yeah. unless they're watching, I yeah. guess, NBC now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, I think I just yeah, there was just certain things where I felt like they could have pushed a little bit more and gone a little bit. But see, that's kind of the thing. Is that if they had pushed a little bit more, would the studio have greenlit the film yeah. and allowed it to be produced? And, and they, yeah, they had to and walk a line. And that's kind of the problem: is the towing of the line, to walk line. causes writing to sometimes make a safer they choice. I think also too, maybe some of the Rebel Wilsony slapsticky stuff bonks just, on a head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like that sort of like. Sometimes they. I'm just yeah. gonna steal your purse. I don't want to rape you. Like yeah. that sort of comedy, like. It doesn't make you deeply feel about a character in, you know, a deep storytelling way. Yeah. Yeah. But it does what it has to do. It was a stupid, fun, yeah. romantic comedy. I'm asking too much. There was lots of singing. There was lots of dancing. There was lots of singing. It looked beautiful. It was very pretty. Shot. Yeah. Very it was nice. very sweet. I did. I was rooting for her and her friend to get together in the end, and they did. So, I guess in that way, mission accomplished. So, I think, yeah, I'll wrap it up and say... Isn't so, it romantic is worth 
an hour and a half of your time, but go in with low, don't go in with high expectations. Go in with normal expectations. And check it out. It was written, the story, it was written by three women. Yes, it was. Danielle. Yeah, and it was directed by a woman. Erin Cardillo, oh, no, it Katie by Silverman, and Dana Fox. It was directed by a dude. Okay. Todd Strauss Schulzen, who also directed, oh, he directed that movie, The Final Girls. Oh, okay. He directed A Very Herald and Kumar Christmas. So there's probably some slapsticky. That's mm -hmm. why he likes the slaps and the sticks. Mm -hmm. He, uh, well, he's done a lot of stuff. He's been busy. Uh, also, I just wanted to give quick, quick props to Simon Dugan. Whoa. New Zealand uh, cinematographer who made this film look friggin' beautiful. Cool. Whoa, he also did The Knowing. He did that movie Knowing. <laughs> he did I, Robot. Whoa. And Whoa. The Great Gatsby. Holy shnikes. This guy makes pretty movies. Um, uh, I think we're going to cut the episode here. I think we're going to save Alita at Battle Angel. For its own episode. As a part two in its own episode. Okay. So or we had a... It's going to be its own episode. This is like this a lady-centric... a beautiful lady-centric analysis of Isn't It Romantic and 2001 Sam Raimi's... <laughs> two films. The Gift. That have nothing in common. Except for having blonde lead women. Yeah. <laughs> In the lead, yeah. This yeah. is, uh, you know. Ooh, you know what they have in common? What? Magical realism. Oh, shit. Bing, bobbity, boom. Can we come up with a title before the end of this episode? Make my life easier? I don't know. You put on a thing. Lady Magical Realism? <laughs> Queen of Lady Magical Realism. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I don't know where that came from. Would Donnie Barksdale have been, like, if you took Keanu Reeves and gave him the Liam Hemsworth role, mm -hmm. with beard and everything, mm -hmm. this would be 20 times better. What? Yeah. No. Yeah. Here's the thing about Donnie Barksdale. I would only bang him if he never smoked. No, I'm saying bearded Keanu Reeves. Yeah. Oh. I'm saying that era, Keanu Reeves. Oh, with Liam Hemsworth? But then I'd want... In Liam Hemsworth role. Yeah, I guess. Not even no. Con Connors could do the comedy. Liam Hemsworth is perfectly fine where he is. Leave him alone. I liked I liked the small little plot point they had that in the real world he was an American. Yeah. And because she's Australian in her fantasy, fantasy world, he's Australian. He's full Australian, so he gets yeah. to keep his accent. I like that. I thought that was a great that touch, and it actually I think helped his performance a lot. Yeah. It did. I wonder if some of the times while his performance seems sort weaker, of weaker, he's struggling weaker, with his American accent. It's because he sucks at doing an American accent, yeah. possibly. It's hard. It's hard it is to. Fine. It is fine. You, it's hard to change your voice and have to worry about character point at the mm -hmm. same time. It is. It's a struggle. Also, while the comp topic conversation is technically at the moment on Liam Hemsworth, I would just like to point out to the Blindacast audience that you should see Liam Hemsworth's performance in the Independence Day sequel. <laughs> it Resurgence? Oh, was that what it was called? I, I, think I, so. I was trying to remember it was Insurgence, it's Resurgence. Resurgence, I think. Horrible title. It's not in the end. Resurgence. It's horrible the end. title. Yeah. Ugh. That movie was such a waste. But the highlight of that film is Liam Hemsworth. Liam Hemsworth. Pissing on a spaceship. Yes, totally. Come on. Totally. That's badass. Of course. I think we're good. I think we're going to wrap it. Yes, Flo. So, do you have cool. any uh, final thoughts for the kids at home? I have no final thoughts except watch a movie that you don't expect to watch. Take a chance. Take a chance. Drive down a do dark a alley and see what movies are. Find somebody to dance with. With somebody to love you. <laughs> dance with somebody. With somebody. <laughs> with somebody. I want to dance with somebody. I want to dance with somebody. Remember to tweet us. With somebody who loves Ask Vundablog at Vundacast. You can email us Vundablog at gmail.com or Vundacast at gmail.com. Subscribe to this podcast, The Vundacast. Leave us a five-star review. Leave us a rating. On the iTunes Please. or the Stitcher. Buy us a coffee. Us. We have a coffee link. Got a if coffee you feel link like down supporting there. us so we can make podcasts. Because this is has been a labor of love. <laughs> yeah, it's, fr it's free. It's totally so every free. now and again, it'd be, it'd be. maybe it could be like a coffee yeah. cup of love, maybe. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, remember to check out Rebel Order, our new Star Wars podcast. Now... In its we 11th have episode. 11th delicious Whoa. episodes for you to enjoy. And you heard it previously on the last episode of the feed was our wonderful episode with uh, where uh, we did TLJ commentary. Yep. 
And, uh, you know, it's a delight. I would, I personally think it's a delight. It's a delight. Delightful. I think it's delightful. I'm your host, Steven. And I'm Danny. And remember, kids, if you're having visions of ghosts coming over and visiting you, make sure they bring you a Coke, bring you something good from the other side, something positive. Sponsored by Coke. Share a Coke. Share a smile. That's what I say. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Come on, give me some sponsorships, motherfucker. Let's go. Coke, sponsor this bitch. Let's go. <laughs> right? That's They're what they definitely want. gonna do it now. Right? Yeah. That would be my pitch too. Sponsor this bitch. Come on, sponsor this bitch. What's up? Look at her. She's got curly hair. She's adorable. You're sweet. In your face. Thank you, now. Hey, I'm Wonder. Wondercast. Give yeah. it up for Wondercast, man. What an adorable name. You're listening to the Voondacast. We're on express elevator to hell. Going down. Two. One. Mark. So what topics do we talk about on the Voondacast? We talk about whatever we like, but mostly we talk about pop culture. We talk about Star Wars. Mira, who's Snow White? She's supposed to be some kind of consultant. Apparently, she saw an alien once. <laughs> Whoopie fucking do. Movies we've seen. Don't lie, all we talk about is aliens. Oh, yeah, right. All we talk about is aliens. All we talk about is bringing things back to Star Wars. <laughs> all we ever do is bring things back to 1997. Don't fuck around. Stop telling the truth. I don't want to hear the truth, man. Did you do it? Did you create other You opened yourself to the dark side of our pair of pretty eyes. Pair of pretty eyes. Pair of pretty eyes. Pair of pretty eyes. Danielle, you are not alone. Neither are you listeners. Mondays at radiate.fm with the Vundercast. Chewing. Home. The Vundacast, which is on Mondays at Radio. Hey, Danielle. Yes. Co host of the Vundacast, co workers. Mm-hmm. How many nipples does Kylo Ren have? Well, only two, but they are glorious. And to find out how glorious they are, tune in Mondays, radiate.fm. Ray Love, all year long, till episode 9 comes out and beyond. Check it out. I am the ultimate badass. Yes, right. State of the badass art. <laughs> you do not want to fuck with me. Hey, radio listeners, you should tune in to us on TuneIn, because the podcast is also there. You should stitch yourself to us on Stitcher, because we're down. And if you want to Google Play with us, our podcast is also on Google Play. But me, I... I just use iTunes to subscribe to my own podcast. Great! That's just fucking great, man! Now what the fuck are we supposed to do? Where's the real pretty shit now, man? You finished. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. What the fuck are we gonna do now? What are we gonna do? Subscribe to the Vondacast.